On January 21st, 2017, my girlfriend Claire, my sister Mara, and myself joined the hundreds of thousands of people in Washington, D.C. to march in the Women's March. It was awesome, it was super inspiring, a little overwhelming, and we took quite a bit away from it. But a few days prior to going to the march, we observed on their website there were a number of rules and restrictions about what we could carry in the march. Some of these rules are carried out through a lot of protests around the country, but they really resonated, resonated with us at the time. One of them was, you weren't allowed to have wooden supports for signs and placards. And we took away from that, like, how are we going to go to this full day march without a handle for our sign? So our discovery and observation of these rules turned what was originally supposed to be a few day adventure into a journey that continues today and um, kind of flipped my creative practice on end. But in order to better understand that, we kind of have to go back to the beginning of my, or my professional practice. So in 2009, as kind of a punk kid re graduating design college and not wanting an office job, I decided to get a job at a machine shop and to start a furniture company in the evenings. In addition to that, I started Lasanable, which is a design collective still going today, that was going to give my furniture company a place to operate from and kind of propel the, the company. And Dixon Brayden, my furniture brand, stuck with a number of very specific things, right? Because at the core of it, it is a brand. So we spoke, we worked with specific materials and specific processes. We had a certain aesthetic. We appealed to a certain type of person and had very specific goals. And kind of if we, if we look at what Dixon Brandon was intended to do, it was intended to create some really cool furniture, get published in some interesting publications, and ultimately sell stuff. Um, and we were relatively successful at that. But kind of looking back at um, starting a furniture business and owning a furniture business currently, I really have no idea what I'm doing, but I get in there and get my hands dirty a bit with it. A few years later, in 2012, I was asked to start teaching industrial design here at the University of Cincinnati. And um, I started, and it was great to get kind of back in the mix and become kind of interacting with the students again and interacting with people kind of on a larger scale. Um, and about halfway through, the, a, a few years into this, I took my first college-level art class. And I think it's kind of important to kind of recognize that I'd gone through school for five years taking a design degree, and I'd never taken an art class before. And about halfway through the class, this, um, I voiced with a professor that I felt a little awkward and kind of out of place trying to create art as a designer. And he made this very simple, simple state to, statement to me. He said, what's the difference? And I said, you know, whoa. Um, while that seems not very profound at the time, I think to me it really weighed quite a bit and it really changed my pr practice right then. So suddenly my work became much more kind of sponta spontaneous. Um, it became much less about function and an aesthetic and much more about context and concept and wit. Um, it started incorporating color into it. Strangely, around the same time, I started wearing entirely gray. Um, but, uh, and it also, I started working kind of in collaboration with people, right? So it was the first time that I became comfortable kind of sharing my creative process with other people. Um, and this work tended to have much more meaning to myself. So rather than selling it or rather than showing it, I just have it and kept it all. Um, so my apartment's kind of cluttered with all sorts of like these odd objects. Um, but we've, I still was rooted in design. A few years later, while still teaching at the University of Cincinnati, I was asked by the ceramics department to join them on a trip to China to study at an artist residency. And I warned them, like, I haven't touched clay since, like, fifth grade art class. Um, but it sounded awesome, so I decided to join. And in preparation for this, I kind of created a plan where I was going to create some functional work to kind of play to my strengths. And then I was going to kind of branch totally outside of that. Um, so this being a piece kind of of the latter, and this is the first thing I ever made that really served no actual physical function. You know, it wasn't something you could sit on. It hangs on a wall in my office. Um, and it's China made in China. And what it, is, what it was is while I was still here in Cincinnati, I went on Google and I downloaded a topographic map of the city we were going to, Jingdezhen. Um, and I turned that topographic map into a physical, physical object. I had it CNC machined here at, on campus, and I took this map, kind of stuffed away in a duffel bag to, to China, and I worked with artisans to turn this physical map that, that, that was generated digitally back into clay, becoming kind of an um, observation of our kind of glut of access of information in the United States relative to limited access of information in other countries. So here's this map of a city that I can download here, a three-dimensional version, that in China they don't have as easy of access to. In the following year, kind of on a similar trip to the same city in China, um, this being 20, end of 2016, I went with the same general plan. Um, but this time I had this phrase stuck in my head, a Chinese hoax. And a Chinese hoax, for people who haven't heard that phrase, was generated during the previous presidential cycle 
Um, in reference to our president thinking that climate change is, was invented by the Chinese government. Um, so I kind of imagine, like, what would it look like if they were really staging this whole thing, you know? Um, so I depicted these iconic scenes of climate change in clay while in China. So you can see we have a desert scene, and I have a scene of um, smokestacks, and I have a scene of a polar bear stranded on an iceberg, all made out of clay while in China. Um, and this was my, my, here I studied industrial design, you know, and this was me branching out kind of well outside of what my kind of study was based in and what I teach in school. Um, and I really don't know where it fits in this greater, greater framework, but I kind of dive in and I get my hands dirty. This time literally in clay. And that brings me back about a month later to the Women's March, and on January 22nd, we're driving home from Washington, D.C., and the whole conversation for the entire drive is about how inspirational the whole um, event was. And we talk about how inspirational the signs were and how great the positivity was and how there was nobody arrested in this giant, or in this giant thing. Um, and we talk about how inspiring everybody is, carrying their hands above their head the entire day because they weren't allowed to have handles on their signs. And we also reference that, like, a... Uh, Every time we go to a rally, we kind of have sign envy, where the night before, you're writing down your sign, and you think, like, yeah, I'm killing it. This is going to be so good. I'm really sticking it to them. And you get there and realize, like, everybody has a sign that says the exact same thing, or, like, you're really not funny, you're really not witty, and you just want to kind of hide it, right? So we kind of decided that there had to be some sort of response to this. In addition, we had a conversation around this phrase that had been coined around professional protesters. Um, and it was kind of this weird thing around how the media had kind of started to talk about how people were being paid to protest and paid to organize, and we certainly weren't paid. Um, and we looked at it as kind of this marginalization of, of mil literally millions of people at the Women's March taking time out of their day to practice civic engagement, and that was the whole point, you know? So, based on this conversation, these conversations kind of on all these points, we developed protest. And protest's aim is to create professional gear for these quote-unquote professional protesters. Um, so we took a few crude sketches and a bunch of photos and a bunch of quotes and put together this kind of weird proposal and received a $10,000 grant from People's Liberty to make protest a real thing. And we took that $10,000 and we made this. Um, this is a democracy preserver. Um, and it's an inflatable, inherently reuse reusable sign. It's inherently dry erase. Um, and it gets its name from most inflatables have a little warning on them saying that it's not a life preserver, right? So ours is the democracy preserver, and our warning label reads this. Warning, this is not a life preserver. It is, however, a democracy preserver. It is your visible voice, and while it might not save your life, it just might save your state. <laughs> and we took this, uh, this idea, and we had 500 made. And we worked with a number of vendors to get packaging made, and we had custom markers printed, red, blue, and black, so hopefully we're not kind of too partisan. Um, and central to protest was that we were going to give these away, right? So we took all this $10,000, we turned them into products, and we started handing them out. So the first photo, we, have a little, we had, had a launch party, and we handed them out there, and we saw people in the way they de decorated. We went to a number of events around the city and around the country to give them away, and we actually partnered with some people on organizing events that we never, we never kind of played a role in the mission of the event. One of the ones that we're most proud of is working on the Dream, Dream Act midterm grade rally. Um, this is a super inspiring rally organized by a number of students at Xavier and a few other organizations to grade Congress members on the relative inaction on um, legislation with immigration. So we go to this rally, they reach out to us, we hand them a bunch of signs. They make report cards about these, about people's inaction on immigration. And we get there, and here this, this rally is organized by quite a few like DACA recipients, you know, students with megaphones that are actually afraid of being deported at some point if, based on this inaction. And one of our most recent things that we do, we've done with protest is we went to Las Vegas last month, and the, the official Women's March organization celebrated the year anniversary at the Power of the Polls rally in Las Vegas, which ended up being the day after most of the marches here. Um, we took our own signs, we took backpacks that we had branded, and we had little ha branded hats, and we took signs of our, of our own messages. And the day before the rally, we went around Las Vegas, where we had never been before, and gave signs to people. And the day of that rally, people that we had never met until the day prior carried our signs with their messages on them. Right? And we'd spot them across the stadium and uh, just have this awesome connection right away. And while this might have seemed like a really small win, it really validated that 
this idea that we had on the car, this kind of like goofy, inflatable thing, um, had really made connections with people and allowed them to better peaceably assemble. And so when I look back at all these projects, seemingly very disparate, right? I've got an inflatable sign, I have ceramics, I have woodworking, I have a business. Um, I realize I'm not an expert in these things. I'm certainly not an expert in protesting. I'm absolutely not a good business person. Um, I'm not a ceramicist, but I realize one thing that I can do really, really kind of well is that you don't have to be an expert to get your hands dirty. Thank you.